Linda Nichols Gidley is a voice and dialect coach and teacher and has been for more than 20 years. She's also a gifted and accomplished actor. Thank you very much for coming along today and spending some time with me. Thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So how did the voice and, and dialect coaching come into your life, given that you started out doing acting? Uh, it was always just going to be the thing I did on the side <laughs> to, help, <laughs> to help with the bills and to, um, yeah, to keep me involved in theatre so I didn't have to do bar work or didn't have to work in a supermarket, both of which I have done. Um, but it was just that that thing that was going to anchor me to the theatre and entertainment world mm. when I wasn't acting. Right. And then it took over somehow. <laughs> <laughs> but you were quite serious about it from the start because you did a, a course at NIDA. Voice was something that I just knew was okay. Mm. You know, one of, one of my earliest memories of my um, stepdad was saying to me, you know, you don't need to be quite that loud in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was there already for ah. me when I was a child. <laughs> and so it seemed a natural progression for me. Some mm. of my friends naturally progressed into movement or, you know, other areas uh -huh. or directing or not that those areas are not something that I could step into, but this just seemed like a really natural fit. And obviously something you had a real affinity for yeah. as you went off and did a course at NIDA and then also did a master's. Yeah, and I have uh, my master's in the esoteric, the use of the received pronunciation accent on the Australian stage in productions of Hamlet. Oh! <laughs> Right, so that's got me so many jobs yeah. thus far. <laughs> yeah. So what have been some of the most interesting and perhaps unexpected jobs that you've done as a, as a voice coach? There are so many sort of weird and wonderful areas that I've been involved in. Just after I had my son, I moved to Melbourne. I came down here Ooh. to... Um, because my husband had worked down here and I found myself working at Fairfax Digital with the journos there at the age. Um, and this was in a time when um, internet news programs were still a new thing. Mm. And I found myself teaching journos how to present, print journalists, how to present for the internet. So that was great. Mm. Um, so that would be quite different for them because writing something is quite different to speaking it. Yeah, and I think that what happens a little bit is that when you're writing something, you do hear what it sounds like or how you think it's going to sound in your head, and that's very different to saying it out loud, mm. and the syntax is different saying it out loud. Mm. Um, and I remember one journo saying to me, yeah, we use um, mean time. And I said, what does, what does mean time mean? And she said, well, it means, you know, in the meantime, or while that was happening, I, and I said, well, how do you use it? And she said, meantime, this was happening in the world. And I went, oh, okay. So I was looking at scripts that they were writing, and, and this is another sort of area that I got involved in, changing their scripts around. So that doesn't make any sense when you say it. So, so, yes, it's quite different when you're speaking to when you're writing in English. Yeah, yeah, and so they were writing the full formal versions of things. I cannot, I would not, you know. We can, we can actually say can't and wouldn't yeah. and shouldn't. Yeah, mm. and in fact that's what we want to hear. Right, yeah. mm. in, a, in a conversational news broadcast, mm. yeah. And you were working with them on autocue. I was working with them on autocue and many of those print journalists had no concept of what that was going to be like. Yeah. You know, reading out loud for some people is as, as difficult as public speaking. It becomes that oh. whole thing of, you know, going back to primary school and having to stand up in class and read aloud from a book. Mm. And so when you're asking them to do that and connect to an audience on the other end of the camera that becomes quite tricky. Mm. So what sort of tips can you give them to be able to contact their audience while they're reading off an auto cue? Just connecting back into their breathing mm. and reminding them that 
um, they need to be speaking to a person, giving them, you know, an imaginary audience, someone that they knew often mm. that would work. Mm. Really tricky mm. <laughs> because you're sight reading and you're having to control either a foot pedal or a hand uh, yeah. dial to control the speed. And oftentimes, you know, they think they read faster than they actually do, and then the auto cue is going this quickly and they can't keep up with what they're doing. Yeah. So you have to give them that sort of sense of keeping the pace at an even rate. And then it's about not actually looking into the word itself, but slightly looking beyond it. So much technical stuff sitting behind what appears to be quite a simple thing to do. It's mm. like, you know, ducks, they look like they're smoothly going along, <laughs> but their, their feet are going like crazy. Yeah. Mm. Now, you just mentioned breathing, which, of course, is one of the foundation skills, I guess, in terms of the voice work that you do. Yeah. What are the 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 key things that you teach people when you're teaching voice? I think if you ask any voice teacher, they will say, really, all we do is teach breathing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, different versions of breathing, maybe. Mm -hmm. Breathing for speech, breathing for um, presence, breathing for calm, breathing for energy. You know, in a way, that's really all we're doing because the voice almost is just a, a byproduct of mm. the breath in a lot of ways. And so it's about how to create, how to increase the breath and control the breath. And, yeah. and how is that different when you're teaching singing to when you're teaching spoken word? I think that for spoken word, what we're really after is a sense of the breath supporting the thought and the word and the emotion and in, in some way connecting that back into the self so mm. that we're not... Um, trying to place something on top of it or, or not trying to push through the breathing to make it into something else. It's about harnessing the breath that you already have as opposed to trying to make it do something. Okay. For singing, what you're really trying to do is get the breath to support a quality of sound often. And you're trying to get that to almost bend to your will in a way mm. because the phrase or the note or the pitch needs to go for a certain period of time or um, you need to reach a particular pitch. So you're really trying to get the breath to support that quality. Mm. But I, I think there's probably more of the control that you're talking about mm. for singing mm. and less of it in a way for for voice for speech. So in terms of what you do, the voice work is about creating the breath, but then the accent or dialect work sits on top of that to create mm. the types of sounds that you're looking for. Would that be right? Voice work kind of exists along a, a, a progression. So we, we would release the body first and then we release the breath because you can't have a free breath without a free body. And then from the breath, we're looking at phonation or making sound. Mm. And then we're looking at shaping the sound. Mm. And so we're really looking at a progression from the whole body into speech. And with that comes the idea of accent. An accent really is just about how I'm using the shaping of the sound. Mm. Isn't I shouldn't have to really say this, but there isn't any magic associated <laughs> with it. You know? Oh, there's heaps of magic. There's so much magic. It's, mag <laughs> it's magical. Totally magical. Mm. You know, it's just muscular use. Mm. And, and the reason we find it tricky is because the muscular use that we have for our own accent is a habit. Mm. So when we're looking at creating accents and dialects, we're looking at trying to create a new habit mm. and we're looking to place the words in different places within our mouths aren't we yeah in a way the tongue has to I, I like to use the idea of choreography mm. it's like you're learning new cory for your mouth right yes and so you know we all have um the same musculature pretty much inside the oral cavity and it's just the way we decide to go about that choreography mm. that creates the accent that we have. And so when we're doing a different accent, all we have to do is change the shape of that place and maybe change the way we're articulating that sound or where we're using the muscular use. Mm. And that's kind of how we do it. 
You're in Melbourne to do a workshop tomorrow. Right. Can you tell me about that? My business partner and I, um, we have a, a company called This Is Not A Drill. Oh. And um, we started to think about how we might like to get voice work into young people and into high schoolers. Mm. You know, they're marked quite hard on their drama um, assignments, particularly in terms of voice. And the two of us sort of got together and decided that, you know, we should give, we should, we should arm the teachers with the tools to be able to help those students find their way through that. Mm. So um, both of us have just been um, certified in a technique called Knight Thompson speech work, which is coming out of the United States. And the primary focus of the technique is that all speech sounds are beautiful all speech sounds are valid and really it's about whether we can understand you communication is really the only standard we can hold ourselves to mm. rather than whether a sound is right or wrong so we're doing some workshops that sort of teach teachers how to play in that sphere and explore all of the sounds in in the mm. same way towards dialect work really discovering all the choreography that you can do. What are you hoping that the students will gain from what their teachers have learned? If and, and I'm probably thinking sort of too high level, but I would love it if the students could get a sense that the way that they spoke was okay mm. and that the sounds that they make, which are so personal and so ingrained with their individual personality can be as um, experienced and intelligent and, um, you know, full of life as all of the sounds that we think we should be making. What I think I'm hearing is this isn't just about drama students. This is about all students and communication right. broadly. It, it's about giving people their voice back really. Mm. We spend so much of our time, uh, I want to say microaggressions about the way people speak, mm. you know, and I think we're not even aware of it a lot of the time. You know, we'll listen to someone and we'll go, ah, did you hear that? I had assumed that what you were doing was working for drama students, but no, it's much more broad than that, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. You know, we spend we spend so much of our time, you know, making these small um, and maybe even imperceptible facial expressions about the way people speak and, and the way we perceive sounds that we hear, good and bad, mm. you know, and, and I'm probably just as guilty of that as anyone. You know, those things are so personal and the voice is really about who we are. Mm. a lot of the time and it's how we're perceived first. Mm. Are these generally drama teachers or what background are the teachers coming from? Simon and I were just in Darwin and we had um, high school teachers, primary school teachers, mm. music teachers, mm. um, singing teachers but also I work a lot in the corporate sector as well mm -hmm. and I've been working with some wonderful women who are looking at advancing their careers mm. and you know speaking into that sphere as well you know there are people from all walks of life that want to or feel that they have to shift the way that they speak. What are you doing with the corporate women? First and foremost is the idea of um, strengthening their voice and mm. finding a way to get more resonance sometimes yes or yeah. to deepen their tone because yes. they feel like they're not being taken seriously yes you know and gravitas is a word that's thrown around quite a lot mm, that they I want to mention yeah they mm. want to feel heard mm. and i think sometimes they feel like they're not being heard because mm. their voices are not as strong or if their voice is strong they feel like they're being perceived as being aggressive mm. so sometimes it's about finding a way through for them where they have the strength but still having femininity as well mm. and you're working with people whose english is a second language they were getting a lot of i'm sorry what did you say or could you just repeat that for me 
And that in and of itself can be quite tricky because you think you're being clear. Mm. So I think there's something about listening that we can key into as well. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, but, yeah, so we, we look at the idea of finding ways for them to become more clear and sometimes that's as simple as changing rhythm. Changing rhythm, why, in what way? English is what we might call a stress-timed language. Okay. So we have... Um, stressed syllables and unstressed syllables mm -hmm. and we can we can kind of liken that to an iambic pentameter in yes. Shakespeare yeah. so we've got a, a light heavy yes kind de -dum, of de -dum, de -dum. right mm. and so we might get things like um, because or decided so we've got two mm. unstressed syllables in decided but a second language speaker who's not from a stress time language so they might be from a syllable-timed language where all the syllables are roughly the same length. Mm. They might do decided, so you get all the syllables the same length, or because. Often that's a, a real eye-opener because they don't even know. They think they're saying the word as is written. And they are. And they are. <laughs> yeah. But because mm. it's not said in the way that we're expecting it to hear, sometimes we get that miscommunication going yeah, on yeah. or a millisecond of having to think oh what did you just say oh okay mm, mm. that's very interesting and even within within the english language there are different stresses in different for different dialects aren't there um for american you might say advertisement in australia you might have advertisement you know, mm. so there are, are little changes or in mm. um, standard british rp you might have library and we mm. might do library. Mm. English is is a very broad language which came from a lot of different other languages, but there are so many different dialects in England that grew up because people didn't travel. So mm. that must have been one of the reasons, or may have been one of the reasons, why there are different stresses and different areas of the words, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah, and so influences from other places. And, of course, isolation is a... A great leveler if you like so uh, what we do notice about accents and languages is that they can um, once we shift them out of their place and time and we put them somewhere else they can actually become more set in stone ah oh, yes because we're creatures of habit and so we preserve what we believe is the the prestige of whatever that is and you can hear that in any migrant community so perhaps that has also part of what's happened in that shift to America they're preserving a particular sound that happened when America was settled by white settlers yes. and the same thing in Australia yes yes you've been doing a project around historical accents and dialects in Australia yeah. tell us about that it's been really exciting uh, um, not least because I get to play and I get to uh, research, which are two of my favourite things to do. <laughs> I can go down lots of rabbit holes on mm. Google if I'm not careful. This project has been about designing accents for the refurbishment of Hyde Park Barracks. Mm. So there's a, an exciting project going on there, which um, will have lots of different voices and exploring the, the landscape of colonial mm. Australia, Sydney Cove. How do you go about recreating those accents when there's, well, clearly there's no, no um, recorded voice? Right. Yes. How do you go about doing that? So you have to go back to the literature, you go back to writing. Mm. And, um, you know, at that, at that point, there really wasn't very much being written about Australia or about New South Wales in books. No. Um, but there was a lot of letters being sent. Oh, letters. Right. Ah, oh, yes. Because I was immediately thinking that what you would have been going to would be things like Charles Dickens, where he right. used lots of different dialects, but I've always thought they probably weren't really very accurate. Or even if they were, it would be quite different to what was out here yeah and you also have to be careful with writers mm. um not that you know i want to disparage dickens but <laughs> um, writers are, when they write in dialect are writing what they perceive yes right and yes. so that can be skewed somewhat yeah 
Um, so no, we went, we've went. we gone back to the letters and some of the early letters about the Australian accent suggested that it was the most pure and beautiful sound that they had heard outside of the mother country. Wow. Yeah. That is totally surprising. Yeah, it's not what you expect at all. No. Um, and it, it didn't take that long for it to shift the other way, <laughs> I have to be honest. Um, you know, a period of, of 30 or 40 years. Mm, and then it's not long. Not long. But if we take the idea that the accent was preserving that migrant sound, mm. then perhaps it was. How interesting. Yeah. And it would have been something of a melting pot because it was a very small community and there were people coming from... Ireland and Scotland and England and right. I don't know where else. Yeah, and they would have had um, influences from all over the place. So they would have mm. had, um, you know, officers that were very um, much born into that status mm. Mm. to people that weren't even close to that, mm. you know, mm -hmm. from all walks of life. Mm. And then you had free settlers coming in and they were from all over the place. So, mm. yeah, it would have been quite a melting pot. Mm. You have another company that you, you've created apart from This Is Not A Drill. Tell me about that. My uh, voice coaching company is called Vocho Vox and that is Latin for summon your voice, oh. which I thought was very clever when I graduated from NIDA. I still think it's very clever, but <laughs> I was being super clever back then. Um, and it has been my company since 1998. Right. Um, and in those early days, it really was just me coaching individuals or mm. on very rare occasions going into um, high schools maybe to coach drama productions. Oh, okay. But mostly it was private clients, mostly actors. Mm. Um, and that started to build quite a bit. Uh, and then I started working at NIDA, so I put it right on the back burner. So even though it was still there, bubbling away, and I still had a few private clients. You worked at NIDA for seven years? Yeah, that's right. Mm. So I was there for um, quite a bit of time as a casual, but working essentially full-time hours. I was mm. there every day. Um, and then on, on a full-time contract. And then when I left NIDA two years ago, I thought, this is my opportunity to really expand. Mm. Uh, and so I just started to think about all of the things I could do and what was possible and how might I go about doing all of the things that were possible. I just decided to try all of them, really. <laughs> so um, in the past, I used to offer um, Skype sessions as a, as a bit of a um, second sister. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in those early days of Skype, connection issues were yes. oh, terrible. Yes. And if, yeah. if you had a good connection but the other person didn't, it still yeah. wasn't great. Yeah. But now with the networks the way they are and the software being so much better, mm. that all makes a difference. Mm. Um, and so now I just offer that as a staple. Mm. You can either meet me in person or we can do this via mm. A Skype or Zoom. And that means you, your clients could be anywhere in the world. And actually I have <laughs> had them all over the world, um, Skyping people in uh, Prague and London and Colombia and Korea and LA and New York and, you know, Bondi. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, because, you know, sometimes it's not just my timetable but mm. theirs, you know. Mm. Actors are running from... Um, auditions to classes to their day jobs yeah and they want to be able to fit it in as well yeah yeah, yeah. what is the difference between doing a session in person with you or doing one on Skype you know that we perceive the distance is there even though you're essentially in the room with them we mm. still perceive that mm -hmm. little bit of distance and I think that when you're in the room there are some vocal cues or, or body language cues that you pick up that you maybe don't mm. on, on a video platform. Mm. Are there any advantages to doing Skype? I can record. I can mm. record the session and send them a link or they can record it and keep the link for themselves. Mm. And what's really useful about that, not that you can't do that in the room, but people often do it 
audio in the room. They don't do it in video. Oh, right. right. Yes. And so listening to something back that you've recorded an audio of is very different. I think people have often less time for listening to an hour mm. back of audio mm. than they do of watching an hour of video. Mm. It's quite useful for the actor to interrogate what's gone on. Yes, yeah, because we don't hear ourselves the way other people hear us. No. So for voice, it would be very useful to be able to hear yourself back. A thing I always say to my clients, which is don't listen to yourself, that's what I'm for. Ah, oh, right. That's what yes. I do. You can always tell when an actor is listening to themselves, you know, in the moment they're mm. taken out by a, a sound or a... A, a word or a phrase that they think that they haven't done properly or, you know, they'd like to do again, that becomes tricky for their acting. Mm. And so when when they're able to listen back or to actually go back and look at footage, mm. go to that moment and see that's when you're doing that accent work the best and you're connected and you can hear the sound shifts happening, have a look at that moment and find out, try and interrogate what you're doing there. Mm. Mm. In the old days, I used to be quite worried about people recording our sessions. Now, as a more experienced teacher, I'm much more aware that people are recording not so that they can share the information to all and sundry. They're actually looking at the information so that they can get better themselves. Um, what are some of the productions that you've worked on as a voice or dialect coach that have been really exciting? My favourite ever production was working on How to Train Your Dragon Arena Spectacular Ooh. because um, because I love science fiction, I love those movies and every day I walked into that rehearsal room, which was not a, a room, it was a massive warehouse soundstage, mm. there were dragons. Four, five, six dragons, you know, fire-breathing, wow. literally fire-breathing dragons that moved and um, it, was so, it was exciting. The room was exciting. They were working on new technology. They were doing enormous video installations of worlds mm. to en encapsulate th these dragons. We had a group of international actors. You know, there were people from everywhere. Mm having to teach them how to sound either Scottish or American. <laughs> um, so it was a massive task, but it was so much fun. And, you know, they were doing acrobatics and I was getting them to vocalise while they were doing acrobatic stuff. And it was such a great project. Sounds like you were on that project for a fair bit of time too. They took the whole thing quite seriously by yeah. the sound of it. Yeah, I got to lead warm-ups and it was, yeah, it was really fantastic. We did big sessions with the entire cast. I had individual sessions with actors. I was there for big runs when they first started because it opened down here in Melbourne. Mm. Uh, so they flew me down for that. And mm. Yeah. Mm. How much time would you ideally like to spend with actors when they're rehearsing for a play or a film? In a, in a perfect world, I would be there at every rehearsal, supporting the actors the entire time. You know, in a, in a slightly less perfect world you know five five to ten hours a week mm. it would be great to get hold of the actors um before rehearsals start mm. because by the time actors are already rehearsing there's so much stuff going on and mm. where you want the accent to be is not a part of their front brain at all. Oh yeah. If it's there, they're really not concentrating on connecting or making choices about their acting. All they're doing is panicking about whether the sounds are right. In a way, I need to get them as babies and then teach them the accents as they're growing up <laughs> and then they'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing. You know, you want mm. to get them as early as you can. Mm. What do you think a voice or dialect coach brings to a production? You know, I, I'm often talking about the idea of um, not teaching people an, an accent, but I'm teaching them to get under the radar so that people can't tell where they're from. Because voices are very personal, there's a lot of trust, a certain amount of trust that you need between the actor and the voice person for them to be able to use their voice in a vulnerable way and to talk to them about, you know, it's okay for you to change your voice in this way to reflect this 
other human that you're becoming and sometimes that can be quite tricky yes so recently I worked um, with an actor who some of the accents were very close to his cultural context and you know that brought up other things so yeah there's a certain amount of pastoral care that goes along with that a certain amount of support and and to give them permission sometimes to sound different and that that's okay mm. Mm. You raised an interesting question in saying that sometimes people look a certain way and, and there are expectations that they will have, be able to achieve a certain accent. And that reminded me of something that Anthony Brandon Wong talks about, which is that Asian actors tend to be expected to be able to do all sorts of different accents People think, oh, you know, it's an Asian accent, of course you can do it. But in fact, mm. we're talking about a whole range of different cultures. Mm. How do you handle something like that? Uh, I often get that with, uh, just teach them African. Um, that's <laughs> a continent. That's not a, you know, so I get, I may be accused of getting on my high horse a little bit. Um, but I had a, uh, I do have those conversations a lot. Yeah, I bet. And... And I try my best to to educate, mm. you know. Um, just because somebody looks a certain way doesn't mean that, it doesn't really mean anything, you know. Mm. Yes, I can do a German accent, but that's not because I am blonde. That's because I have a facility with accents, mm. you know, and I've, I've worked on them. At the beginning of the year, I worked on counting and cracking. Uh, which was the most magnificent play put on as a co-production with Co Curious, Belvoir and Sydney Festival. And um, being one of the only Westerners in the room and also uh, being the person who was in some way the arbiter of the way people spoke was really humbling mm. because how do you approach that when the majority of the cast was Sri Lankan and Indian and, and Australian or Anglo-Indian and, and say this is the way mm. Sri Lankans speak. So how did you do that? With a great deal of care. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, um, and openness about my ability as a, an accent coach and also openness about the fact that there were Sri Lankans in the room and that if yeah. they wanted to check something, that I was quite happy for them to check it. Mm, that would have been an extraordinary experience. Yeah. Mm. But an enormously rewarding one. Mm. You have been working on Shrek. Yes, so I have been. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's so much fun. Um, <laughs> Awesome songs and a fantastic cast. It's going to be a lot of fun for everybody to watch. You know, the way it's being approached is not melodramatic. It's not, um, you know, Christmas pantomime. It's a story with heart. And so, hmm. you know, there's a real sense of these characters operating from a sense of hurt or, you know, from a real desire to have love and compassion and and those kinds of things and what's your role been is that's a musical it's a musical how different is it to be teaching people voice and accents in a musical as distinct from uh, a straight play so in the, in the big musicals um everything runs like absolute clockwork which is fantastic because you know where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be there and how long you've got to be there for. Roles are very clearly defined, much like on a film set, you know, mm -hmm. roles are very clearly defined. And so my role in, in that world is only as accent coach. In a play, in independent theatre, I might work across a couple of different areas. So I might be talking to them about the idea of projection because of course in a big musical they'll have microphones yeah. and I might be talking to them about the way that you know they land on a, a particular word or or phrase which a, a little bit comes into accent work just in terms of that stressing and emphasis mm. we talked about before mm. but there's a little bit more leeway I think in a straight play mm. often 
Mm. And is a straight play different from a comedy? In terms of accent work, yeah. they absolutely can be. Mm. And mostly from intonation perspective, you know, laugh lines are delivered in different ways in different accents. Wow. And so, yeah, it's really interesting. So when we're talking about intonation, um, you know, those things can be startlingly different from each other. Mm. People will talk about American accents, you know, resolving at the ends always. But actually sometimes they don't. And understanding how that, that shift in rhythm and intonation happens in a comedy is really important. Otherwise the laugh doesn't land. Mm. That's absolutely fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. So you've talked about the big productions that you've done, but you've also worked at the other end and worked in some quite small independent theatre. What what has been your role there? Because it can't be quite as easy with um, very limited budgets. No, and what I find is, and, and I actually think this is quite important, I spoke to a director and an independent theatre producer about this earlier this year. From a, a, an experienced theatre practitioner perspective, I guess if I call myself that, mm. I think it's important to give back into the community. Mm. And so often now I will get my rate and then I will work many hours beyond that. Yeah. Um, partly because I really believe in the work that we're all doing as artists and we're all doing it hard, but also because I just love being in rehearsal rooms mm -hmm. and I love that, that feeling of everybody trying to work together. Mm. And you can get such joy out of that when, when you know that People are all working together to do the best job that they can do. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to say smallest production. I worked on a, a two-hour one-man monologue this year. Wow. Yeah, which had an enormous number of different accents in it and different characters and, and whatnot. It feels like it, it's the smallest but also one of the biggest. It do would you know be, that? absolutely. Mm. Mm, tremendous amount of work yeah. involved. Mm. Yeah. How much time were you able to spend with that individual? It was a beautiful production and I loved those people. I spent a lot of time with them, <laughs> a lot of time with them. Um, and I'm really privileged to have been allowed to be in that rehearsal room. Mm. When you build relationships with directors, certainly from a, a voice and dialect perspective, it becomes such a beautiful process because there's a, a sense of you working together. Mm, mm. Sometimes directors can feel a bit threatened. Mm. You know, they know that you're there mm. for a good mm. reason, yeah. but yeah. they're not quite sure what you're saying in your individual tutorial and what did you say to that person and I would like you to tell them this. And mm. I've had colleagues uh, in the States who have been told they need to give their notes on paper to the director and the director will decide what note the actor gets. I haven't had that experience. Mm. Um, but I do um, things now that I maybe wouldn't have 10 years ago mm. where I record all of my notes as voice memos and I send mm. them individually to the actors and then if the director wants to listen to them they can hear my dulcet tones on the voice recording giving them notes which is way more useful than giving them written notes. Uh, you just mentioned your dulcet tones. <laughs> yes. What change do you think has happened in your own vocal patterns and your own accent as a result of all the work you've done? I made some very clear decisions about the types of vowel sounds that I would like to use and I know that I don't sound like the rest of my family. Right all of the time. Uh -huh. I do sound like my family when I'm with my family. Uh -huh. So I do, this, I do this thing called code switching, which we all do, Yes. which is a linguistic term. And what it just means is that we have different modes of speech for we, the different people we talk to. I reckon we trope. I think right. there's a real strong troping. Um, so it's a real thing. So now you can say, I do code switching. <laughs> and people will be like, what? And you're like, no, I do. <laughs> um, so <laughs> uh, I used to think my voice was really boring mm. and too low and too, you know, flat. I'm not sure when I discovered that it 
it actually wasn't. But I went, after I graduated from acting school, I went to get my voice, you know, fixed and more interesting because I thought it was ah. terribly boring. Interesting. Yeah. Do you sing? I was trained to sing, but I don't sing anymore, mm. really. I mean, I sing around the house. Mm. And I sang last night. <laughs> <laughs> People often ask me if I'm a singing teacher. Hmm. They go, oh, you teach voice. Do you teach singing? It's just not something that I feel like is in my bag of tricks. Okay. Speaking of your bag of tricks, in the introduction I said that you are an actor and you are an accomplished actor. You've been treading the boards again recently. Yeah, and I hope, I hope I will get to do it again very soon. Again, when I decided to leave NIDA, one of the things that I decided I would do was to do all of the things I hadn't allowed myself to do for a long time. Mm. And it was one of those you've got nothing to lose moments. Yeah. And how wonderful. I know. And I feel like it's, um, it maybe is also an age thing, you yes. know, when you suddenly go, well, I don't really care what you think anymore. This is me and this is yeah. what I do. Yeah. So Yeah. And I better do it now. Yeah. I'm going to take the plunge. Yeah. And so it was really like that for me. And I just, I saw a couple of auditions and I thought, well, that could be me. I could do that. And people just said yes. And I was quite shocked, actually. I was like, oh. Oh, I didn't really expect you to say yes. Okay, great. Now I have to learn a monologue <laughs> and, oh, my God, what am I doing? But it, it was great mm. and really frightening, mm. you know, to be back on a stage in Sydney after what felt like a millennia yeah. away. Yeah. Then all those sort of second thoughts of, oh, what are you doing? Can you, do you really think you could do this? Um, but, you know, it turned out okay and I didn't die. So that was great. So what did you learn about yourself from going back and doing that? It never leaves you. Mm -hmm. and, and that you can do all of the things. You don't need to tell yourself you can't. People are not thinking what you think that they're thinking. So stop mm -hmm. thinking that they're thinking them. Yes. Right? Yes. You're thinking the things that you think that they're thinking. Now we're getting into that sort of meta thing. But <laughs> people don't buy a ticket to see theatre to watch you fail. They're only coming to watch you have fun and they're coming because they want to have a good time. You're absolutely right. Yeah. And I think I had been saying that for years, but I really discovered that, you know, in that moment mm. of going, oh, that's right. People don't want me to suck. They actually want me to do really well. Yeah. My last question is where do you hope your business will be and you will be in five years' time? I'd really like to now, after a year of um, 18 shows that I've coached I w uh, and theatre shows, all theatre shows, also two short films, um, I would really like to branch out more into film mm. and see you know, where that can take me. And given that there are so many more platforms now and so much content being developed, right? the world should be your oyster. Oh, I'd love that. Mm -hmm. I would love that. I'd love to travel and I would love to travel and do coaching as part of that. That mm -hmm. would be great. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to do some more acting, you know, if the opportunity arises. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Any directing? Yes, there's a couple of little projects that would be quite special, I think, if I can find the right venue and the right people, mm. getting that kismet to happen. Mm. Well, I feel like there's been some kismet happen today. Thank you so much for coming along today. Linda, it's just been a delight spending time with you. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great. Good. <laughs> I've been with Linda Nichols-Gidley. Thank you so much for watching Tete a Tete.